Okay, hi everyone, and um, thanks for joining us today uh, for our QNAP webinar on Thunderbolt NAS. Hopefully we'll show you why we think QNAP should be a big part of your content workflow. I'm Tom, I'm the channel manager for the UK and I'll be taking the first part of the webinar before our technical manager Craig picks up for the second half. So the agenda for today will be to talk a little bit about why we think you should be using QNAP NAS in the media and entertainment world. I'll touch upon the advantages of using NAS over DAS in this environment. Uh, we'll then look at a few of our product, Thunderbolt products in more detail before Craig takes us through some live demos. One of the bits of the feedback we often get from customers um, expecting the NAS to present over the Thunderbolt like a normal DAS, um, which isn't the case. So Craig's going to show us how to set it up, what it looks like, etc. And then we'll put a TBS 872XT through its paces with some performance tests so you can see the sort of speeds that you should be expecting. So let's get started. Why should you be using a QNAP NAS to handle your incredibly important media files? Well, first off, the protection that RAID offers ensures that those incredibly important files are looked after and safe from drive failures. But QNAP also offers protection in terms of NAS to NAS backup, snapshots, and NAS to cloud backup as well. Additionally, we now offer a ZFS based file system um, on more and more of our SMB NAS units. Uh, as I'm sure you'll have come across corrupted files before, which can happen when data is stored for a long period of time or if, um, when, when data gets moved. This ends up in dropped frames of video files or missing pixels in images and stuff like that. The ZFS is a self-healing self file system which uses end-to-end -end checksums to retain data integrity, meaning that you shouldn't get that corruption anymore. It's not currently an operating system that we offer on any of the Thunderbolt units, um, but it should be available as a license in Q1, and there may be some Thunderbolt products that ship with that OS uh, in the future. Given the amount of data we're all storing is increasing and showing no signs of slowing down, the expandability of NAS units is another key benefit. Um, it's just not practical or efficient to store 4K video files locally or on loads of external hard drives, having to swap between them and stuff like that. Our biggest unit is 24 bays and can take uh, 816 bay expansion units, which provides petabytes worth of storage if required without needing to rip and replace the initial hardware. We're also compatible with most popular editing software uh, and Final Cut, Adobe, no problems there, things like that. From a security point of view, your content is protected by AES 256-bit encryption, um, and you also have the ability to set individual permissions and privileges, ensuring the teams can only have access to their work or limited to read-only, things like that. But the main benefit of using a QNAP NAS in your workflow is the performance that we can offer. Um, Intel Z and all core processors available, a gradable RAM, and um, all things that make sure your backup or post-production work is smooth and efficient. There is no point having fast storage, however, if your bottleneck is going to be the network, which is where our connectivity comes into play. Um, in order to maximise the performance available and avoid those bottlenecks, we offer both 10 gig and Thunderbolt NAS solutions. As 10 gig is becoming a more and more commonly used network solution, it's a solution that's already offered on a majority of our SMB products and definitely above. Um, for those that don't ship with 10 gig pre-installed, they are 10 gig ready and so can be upgraded with a simple installation of a 10 gig PCI network card available as SFP Plus and RJ45. 10 gigs are a really simple and effective way to immediately boost the performance of your storage. Like I said though, it's a commonly used connection now, which means a lot of our competitors offer 10 gig solutions. What a lot of our competitors don't offer though is a Thunderbolt solution. Um, as Thunderbolt is a popular connection in the M&E world, given its speed and widespread use of Max. It's a huge selling point for adding QNAP to your workflow. Whilst QNAP aren't unique in offering a Thunderbolt NAS solution, we were first, and we certainly have the most stable and usable product in this market. It gives all the benefit of uh, network storage with the speed and versatility of Thunderbolt. So uh, NAS versus DAS. So direct attach storage is great for ease of use. Um, but as we can match the speed benefits of Thunderbolt, the added features you get with network attached storage make it a non-argument for me. As you can see, the uh, expandability and capacity of NAS is one benefit, but really it's about the collaborative nature of centralized storage that wins out. With QNAP NAS, you can have multiple editors connected by Thunderbolt or 10 gig, whilst everyone else on the local network can still have full access to your, all of your files, it's like saving and backing up their work whilst in the office without the need for swapping physical connections from one hard drive to another or one client to another. On top of this, with the NAS, you also get remote access to your files, downloading files to work on at home or upload your raw footage to a centralised location without needing to carry a load of external hard drives around with you. Drives that can get lost or damaged and losing files in the process. With the NAS properly configured, your entire file share can be available wherever you are, uh, as long as you have an internet connection. So here I've uh, 
It's got an example of a workflow using QNAP NAS. Obviously, the content is created and then it has to be uploaded to the NAS, um, presumably from an external hard drive or SD card. We have one touch copy buttons for this process to sort of simplify and speed up the upload time. You set up rules on the NAS so that when a drive is connected um, to a certain slot or port on that NAS, you hit that button and then all of those files on the hard drive are immediately copied to, um, to a pre-designated folder on the NAS. Um, just means you don't need to log into an OS and drag and drop files across. So just nice and simple, plug in the drive, hit the button, walk away and come back however long it takes for that, that data to be copied across. Uh, once, they, once those files are there, um, they can then be edited online over the Thunderbolt mm -hmm. connection and the finished project saved back to the NAS. Um, once saved back to the NAS, they can be viewed by anyone with the right permissions on the network or shared out privately to clients via download links. And finally, you can then set up a second or third copy backup of that of those projects, either to another NAS at an offsite location um, or to a cloud provider of your choice through our onboard APIs. So onto what our Thunderbolt range looks like. Um, we have a, on the left hand side, we have a low end or S SMB Soho four bay product, generally for use by one or two users, maybe a photographer, something like that. It's got an Intel Celeron chipset uh, and it's the cheapest in the range, but it still comes with 10 gig and Thunderbolt three as standard. Then we have our uh, 72 XT range, which are most popular units now in terms of numbers sold. They come as a four, six or eight bay uh, and the internal specs change according to the, the number of bays. So the eight bay is the top spec with the i5 and 16 gig of RAM and the six bay has uh, an i3, etc. as we go down. On the right hand side, we have our beast, the TVS 1282T3. Um, which we're going to look at in a little bit more detail in a second. But here you can see the highlights, ships with an i7. There's a hybrid storage architecture uh, in that it has both 3.5 inch hard drive bays and 2.5 inch SSD bays on the front of the NAS and can have up to 64 gig of RAM and is the highest performing Thunderbolt NAS that we offer. So as promised, here's a little bit more in-depth view of the uh, 1282 T3. Typical use case for this unit would be a company that needs multiple editors. Um, directly attached into the storage. So it needs to have multiple Thunderbolt ports uh, and then the performance to back that up as well. As you can see, it's got four Thunderbolt ports on the back, which will allow those editors to connect directly. But it's also got a couple of 10 gig ports as well. So the unit can sit on the network for everyone else in the company um, and they're not limited to a one gig pipe, so it's fast storage for everyone. Uh, as mentioned, it's, it's got a hybrid storage architecture whereby you have both SSD and hard drive bays within the unit. What you can't see from the pictures on the right, but you should be able to see from the blueprint, is that we have two inbuilt M.2 slots internally as well. So you end up with um, three distinct speeds of storage within the one device. Outside of the M&E world, we normally recommend our Q-tiering software for that, which would move hot data from the cheaper, slower hard drive storage to the faster, more expensive SSD storage as required. But in a workflow environment that doesn't really get the best out of storage is you'll want more control over who and what uses that fast storage. So with this unit, we typically see the SSDs used as a dedicated scratch drive for the editors, um, while the rest of the office uses the hard drive for a more generic file share, and perhaps using the M.2 slots as a cache to speed up that volume. Uh, and with this unit, we still have room for an empty PCIe slot so you can expand or upgrade the unit at a later date. I also wanted to quickly show you the TBS 872XT, um, as it's the NAS that Craig is going to be using a little bit later on for the live demo. Uh, a little bit more regular in its form factor, you'll see we've lost the four two and a half inch SSD bays on the front of this unit. Um, for the record though, and if you weren't already aware, all of our three and a half inch hard drive drive trays um, can take two and a half inch SSDs without the need for an adapter or a uh, flux card or anything like that. They've got the little screws for the two and a half inch drives. Um, on the bottom right there, you can see the one touch copy button I mentioned earlier for that um, speed of, and ease of ingest. Um, and on the back of the unit, on the next slide, um, you can see the four and six bay units in the top right hand corner. You see that across the range here, even though those units lose hard drive bays and, and get physically smaller, all three of them keep to two Thunderbolt ports and a 10 gig port, which while less than 1282T3 we just looked at, still allow you to connect two direct attached editors as well as keeping a fast 10 gig connection into the network. It's got big fans there moving nice and slowly to keep the unit cool without generating a lot of unnecessary noise that you might get on a rack unit that has smaller, faster spinning fans. It's quite important because these units are often not in a server room um, due to the length of Thunderbolt cable available. They're probably sat on a desk in the middle of an office. So that, that noise and heat that they generate is actually quite important. Uh, what the image doesn't show you here is that 
the, this unit still carries the onboard M.2 slots. Um, and for this unit, they're actually PCIe NVMe compatible as well. So really super quick, um, which should be used for caching to increase performance. Uh, and again, on this unit, we still have a spare PCIe slot, uh, which allows you to upgrade the unit as you see fit. On this unit, it's a decent spec slot as well, which means it can be used for adding multiple 10 gig ports or more fast SSDs via some of our QM2 cards. Um, or you could simply use that slot to add a, a JBoard expansion chassis if you needed more storage um, and you, were, you wanted that storage to run quickly. And the last product I wanted to talk about before we go on to Crate's demo session is our Q&A adapters. Um, what we have here basically is a 10 gig to Thunderbolt 3 adapter um, so that you can connect Thunderbolt 3 enabled devices like a MacBook Pro to a non-Thunderbolt NAS unit over 10 gig. Whereas before that connection might have been limited to one gig Ethernet, um, now you get the benefit of 10 gig speeds. And when we're talking about transferring large 4K or even 8K video files, it's going to re represent a really massive decrease in the time that it takes to transfer those files and even allow editing online uh, for client devices that have previously required copying of the data all, all down locally so that they can edit there. They're available as SFP Plus and Base T models uh, and they're bus powered as well, so they can easily be transported around without the need for separate power supplies. Um, they also work both ways as well. So you can connect a Thunderbolt 3 client device to a 10 gig NAS, obviously, but also um, you can connect a Thunderbolt NAS to a 10 gig workstation. Um, so if you use Windows or uh, using the Thunderbolt 3 ports on the client and for something else, um, then you can still connect by a 10 gig to the, to the NAS. So here's a small workflow example of how they might be used. On the left, you can see we're using the MacBook Pro as the edit station, which doesn't have 10 gig. Um, then we're connecting to to our adapter from there and then from our adapter into one of our 10 gig switches and then you're connecting out to a non-thunderbolt NAS at the end um, still utilizing that 10 gig transfer rate. As the adapter is only about 150 quid and the switches can be as low as sort of 400, if the, um, if the budget is really low or, or tight and or for some reason you can't upgrade to a thunderbolt NAS um, then this is a really clean and cost-effective solution to ensure maximum performance from existing kit. There is another benefit or potential use case to these adapters in a workflow environment, and that's the limitation of Thunderbolt cable length, um, which is currently two to three meters. Um, and that means that if you want all your Thunderbolt machines connected to Thunderbolt storage, then everybody using that, that, that storage needs to be sat within two meters of the, of the storage, which often in an office environment isn't particularly practical. However, 10 gig has a much longer reach. If you were to use a Q&A adapter, then you can still utilize the Thunderbolt ports on the Mac but you wouldn't need to have the NAS on a desk or in the middle of the office. This would be particularly useful if you wanted to use one of our larger, more powerful rack units that doesn't ship with Thunderbolt, uh, but do have a lot of 10 gig ports. This unit can then be tucked away in a server room while still giving that fast performance to the editors. It also allows you to have more direct attached connections for editing. If you take, for example, that TBS 1282T3 with its four Thunderbolt port and two 10 gig ports, you could now directly connect six editors um, to those ports using those adapters um, and then use the one gig ports on the unit to connect into the network um, and use for the, for the more generic file share that way as well. So it's kind of um, a little added bonus to get more out of those units if you wanted more direct connection. Um, so that is, uh, that's it for me, pretty quick presentation. Um, Thanks for listening. I know it's a bit slide heavy, but uh, unfortunately, it's always Craig that gets to have the most fun with the uh, performance demos. So I will um, I'll pass over to him now. OK, thanks a lot, Tom. Um, so hi, Craig. Uh, I'm the uh, technical manager here at QNAP UK. And today I'm going to uh, go through the, uh, the the setup and settings that I've got here on the, the TVS 872 XT that I've got on the desk next to me here. Um, for the demo, I'm going to do a, a performance benchmark test uh, with a with AJA System Test Lite, which is a, a tool which allows you to adjust sort of the resolution, uh, resolutions, the codecs, uh, file sizes, and things like that, so that you can get an idea of what the performance will be um, from the NAS in its configuration to see if you've got it set up in the way that will suit the workflow that you're planning to use. Um, so I've got uh, two separate Macs connected. I've got a, an older MacBook Air here, which is actually Thunderbolt 2. So I'm using the Apple uh, Thunderbolt 2 to Thunderbolt 3 adapter to link it into the Thunderbolt 3 ports on the back of this NAS. Um, so if you do have um, older uh, Mac devices and you're worried that you've got Thunderbolt 2 um, and you haven't upgraded to Thunderbolt 3 based Macs yet or, or PCs, um, then that's just fine. You can use the adapter to use it and I'm going to illustrate that as well. Obviously the performance will be a little bit less with Thunderbolt 2, but I'm going to run a performance test here simultaneously 
from the MacBook Pro I'm using, which is Thunderbolt 3 native, um, and also the, the MacBook Air, which is Thunderbolt 2 through one of those adapters. Um, everything's working just great. Everything's on the desk here with me, and I'll, I'll show you how that works. Um, so just before we jump into the performance sim, I'll show you the, the configuration that I've got set up here. Um, so with this NAS, I've actually got um, five uh, IronWolf Pro discs from Seagate um, installed here with the IronWolf Health Management down at the bottom. Um, so I've got these set up um, just in a, a big RAID all together, offering around 50 terabytes of storage. Um, and down at the bottom, I do also have um, our QM2 card installed. So I'm not actually using the onboard M.2 slots because I just so happen to have four of these nice NVMe adapters, uh, uh, SSDs from Seagate. Um, so I'm using the uh, QM2 4P384, which I think you can see here in the system status information. So I've got this card inserted into the PCI Express slot in the back that Tom was talking about, um, which gives me the ability to effectively turn this, you know, what we call an, an eight bay NAS. Um, I've actually effectively now got 14 bays, including the onboard two. Um, I haven't got everything filled, um, but you can always add more storage, more capacity, more speed um, using those PCI Express slots. They, they definitely make the installation a lot more flexible. Um, if you'd rather, you could obviously just use the M.2s on board um, with two of these, uh, M, of these MVMEs, and you can use the PCI Express slot to expand the storage instead if that's what you wanted to do. Um, so yeah, it's a very, uh, very flexible setup that you can set up with this unit. If I go to the uh, storage and snapshot screen, we can see I've got two uh, volumes effectively set up. I've got the system volume. Uh, this is the one I'm going to be testing with, and this is the one that's running on the MVMEs. Um, but in the background there, I've also got a 50 terabytes of storage allocated there for any other purpose. Um, and as Tom said, you could use the onboard M.2 slots as, say, an SSD cache to accelerate this um, slower volume on the hard drives if you wanted to. Um, but this is just a way to illustrate that if you've got some SSDs, you can use um, the SSDs as a scratch drive, as, as the place you do the editing. Move the data in there, the, the, the source data into it that you're going to be doing ed video photo editing from um, so that you're working from fast storage all the time. As soon as your project's finished, you've rendered it out, you don't need it anymore, you can just move it back over to the storage storage volume, which is massively bigger and massively cheaper as well. Um, obviously, hard drives are a lot less expensive than the especially NVMe SSDs. Um, but when you compare the speed of a, a normal SSD, um, so like a two and a half inch SATA based SSD with an NVMe, um, it's a massive performance difference. So with these um, um, IronWolf 510s here, these are delivering about 3.2 gigabytes a second. Um, when you look at a normal SSD, it's about 0.6 of a gigabyte per second. So whilst the cost difference isn't that much higher for NVMEs, uh, you're getting nearly six times the performance boost by having the NVMEs in the device. And our QM2 cards are relatively low cost. I think most of them are under the £200 mark. So once you add one of those, it gives you four extra drive bays effectively um, for the NAS. So it's nice and easy to, uh, to get connected. Um, I'll show you how I've got this unit connected in our network and virtual switch as well. Um, so as Tom mentioned, we do have quite a few ports on this device. Um, everything in green here is something's uh, connected to them. So the top two Thunderbolt 3 ports there are both green, so I've got two separate Macs connected to it. And at the bottom, I've got the onboard 10 gig connected as well. So if I go check out the interfaces, we can see I've got a 10 gig connection where I've got this unit linked off to a 10 gig switch. Um, in that 10 gig switch, you could have a lot of different 10 gig devices connected in there. So you could have you know, you know, iMac Pros, um, Mac Pros, things like that, that have 10 gig built into it, all linked into the switch. And as Tom mentioned, you could always have those much further away from the NAS than having to be within two or three meters um, with the Thunderbolt cable limitation. So it does open it up to a, a much wider possibility of people being able to connect to the device. So here I do have the 10 gig. And if I click at the top there, we've got the Thunderbolt connections as well. So here I can see that I've got two green lights because I've got two Thunderbolt uh, devices connected to this unit. If you ever wanted to configure it away from the default generic IP addresses, we can do that in the virtual switch. So close the wizard down. So here in the virtual switch, you can go in here and configure it and set specific IP addresses if you wanted to. So you can change those um, uh, to something that's a bit more static, a little less automatic if you wanted to, to fix it in place to a, a different address. So that would work just fine. Now, one side benefit of having all these interfaces on the QNAP is that we can actually route connections through the QNAP. So you might have seen um, Tom talking about our QNA adapter, which effectively turns a Thunderbolt 3 port into a 10 gig LAN port. Well, we actually 
have that functionality built into the NAS. So if you do happen to have the setup that I have here, where this NAS is connected to a 10 gig backbone in the office, to, a, to, to the infrastructure in the office with 10 gig, any Mac or PC that is connected through these Thunderbolt 3 ports can actually have no other network connection to the network if you don't want them to. They don't have to have their Wi-Fi on, their, their 1 gig or 10 gig LAN connections built into themselves does not have to be used to connect them to the wider network. You can actually use our Thunderbolt to Ethernet converter feature, which takes the Thunderbolt 3 input from your computer and it lets you go out to the network via the 10 gig bandwidth. So if you did happen to have, like in my situation here, I do have a, a MacBook Air with the Thunderbolt 2 port connected. Um, I could have it root through through to the 10 gig and have 10 gig network access as well without having to buy anything extra. Um, so it really does give you an advantage, especially if you have multiple NAS um, on the network. Perhaps you've got two users connected directly to this 872XT unit, and maybe you've got another 872XT at the other side of the office with another couple of computers connected to it. Well, you could actually have editors connected to QNAP1 with their Thunderbolt connection you could have them working live on 4K video if you wanted to on the other QNAP on QNAP2, so long as they were networked together with a 10 gig connection because the users are still coming in with a very high speed Thunderbolt 3 connection to the first NAS. They will be scaled down to the 10 gig connection across to the other NAS, but they will have 10 gig bandwidth between the two NAS to work on their data. Um, so it's a very, very useful feature and there's no need to buy say 100, 150 pound um, uh, Thunderbolt to um, Ethernet converter to do that. If you have this NAS, it's already got that feature built in. Um, to configure it, you would normally do that directly within our QFinder software here. So within our QFinder uh, tool here, uh, you can create a Thunderbolt connection directly from the device. So in the configuration settings, um, if I was to change this type across to Thunderbolt here, I didn't want to open up the config. Um, but yeah, it's going to show that I've got a Thunderbolt connection. So if I wanted to, I can connect onto this um, directly as a Thunderbolt to Ethernet converter. Um, I'm not going to do that in this session right now because it will um, it changes the network settings. So it will disconnect uh, my connection to the GoToWebinar, which would obviously uh, you'd not be able to see what was happening anyway. So I'm not going to do it here, but there is a button up here for T2E um, that lets you configure that if you do want to use that feature. So it's uh, very, very, uh, very easy to set up. The, the wizard does everything for you. Um, so now I'm going to talk about mounting shares um, or how to mount the storage um, directly to your computer. So traditionally, um, if you have a, a true DAS device, a true direct attached storage device, if you connect it to your computer, it just mounts, it just appears. It's just, you know, on a Mac, it would appear on the desktop or in the Finder window. Um, on, on a Windows PC, it would just appear in Explorer, um, where it's just, there's a new drive letter that you would access. When you first connect the QNAP um, over Thunderbolt to a computer, um, actually nothing happens because it's, although it's a DAS connection, we're, we're doing networking over the connection. So if I was to show you my, as system preferences and network options here. Uh, excuse me. If I go to the Thunderbolt bridge, so I actually have an IP address assigned to my Thunderbolt connection. So it's still a networked connection, which is how we can do collaboration on the storage. That's how we're able to get multiple people to access the data at the same time. And that's what also allows you to have remote access to the data as well. Um, so here, if I was to go into my finder window, what I would do is I would actually go down to the network option and here in the network option, we're going to see lots of, I've got lots of different NAS and devices here, but we'll actually see the TVS 872XT listed quite a few times. So what we're seeing here is I've actually got the AFP protocol enabled as well. So AFP is the Apple filing protocol. So anybody that wants to still use that can, I do have that turned on here, but you've also got it listed here with AFP with another bracket next to it called Thunderbolt. Now this is because I have two connections to this NAS. So right now I'm connected with Thunderbolt to the NAS, but also I'm on the same Wi-Fi network that the 10 gig connection is linked to as well. So I've got two paths to this. Now because I'm only connected with Wi-Fi, if I was to choose the non-Thunderbolt option, my speeds are technically gonna be limited by my Wi-Fi speed. That's the route it's going to take to the, uh, to the storage. If I was to choose one of the Thunderbolt options, it's gonna go down the Thunderbolt path instead. Um, so it's always important that if you are doing the, the high speed connections, you would pick the Thunderbolt. For anybody that wasn't connected to the NAS with the Thunderbolt connection, these Thunderbolt options will not exist. So it looks a bit simpler for them to access it. Um, but here, if I was to click the Thunderbolt option that I've got chosen here and mounted, um, I can see the different shares that I've got so sorted on the device. So every share here except the data folder at the top is actually on the SSDs. Um, the data folder is on the hard drive. So I can show you the configuration of that here as well in the control panel. 
So if I go to the shared folders, we can see that the data folder, data vault one, that's my 50 terabytes of storage that I've got on the device. Everything else on the system folder, the public, web, and homes and home folder, um, they're all stored on the system drive, which was configured as the uh, the SSD set up there in array 10. Um, so that's um, largely how you would mount a share um, directly. So you would just come in here, access it, and you're accessing the storage. And you can use this any way you want, um, just like any normal share. Um, it's just obviously, if you're connected over Thunderbolt, it's going to be much, much faster um, than especially Wi-Fi or one gig networking. Um, obviously, if you've got, if you're lucky enough to have a new Mac that's got the, the 10 gig networking, um, this is still going to be faster than that as well. It's not going to cap out at uh, Thunderbolt, uh, uh, sorry, at 10 gig speeds. You're going to be able to get uh, much higher speeds using the Thunderbolt 3 connection. Um, so now what I'll do is I'll show you a performance test. So if I was to open up our AGA system test light, um, so I am actually connected to the volumes public share on this NAS. So it's not testing my local drive or anything like that. Um, I've got it set up as a, a 5K resolution, um, one gig test file size, and I've sort of made it the worst possible here. I've set it up as a really high 16-bit uh, RGB um, codec type to really uh, push the limit here. So this was a test I was doing earlier. Now, if I click start on this, it's going to go up and run that performance test continuously. It's going to do a write and it's going to do a read. So that's working really well. That's working really nice. So now here's the collaborative effect. So if I was to pull in down here, I've got a team viewer across to the MacBook Air that I've got. It's the only way I could get both on screen at the same time. So if I click start on this one as well at the same time, we can see with both running simultaneously, um, we're able to get absolutely massive speeds to this storage device. Um, just to illustrate here, um, this is also testing to the volumes public slash MacBook Air folder that I've got set with exactly the same resolution, test files, and codec sizes. Um, so here, the, the combined bandwidth between these two, oh, sorry, cat's fighting out the window, um, but these two uh, units together um, are able to give absolutely massive speeds. So the combined speed there is nearly 2,000 megabytes per second with these. Um, and you've also still got the 10 gig interface that you could have other users coming in on as well. You know, those SSDs that I've got installed in here, um, they're quite capable of over nearly 3,000 megabytes per second with those IronWolf 510s. Um, and I've got four of them in there. So there's, there's really a lot of bandwidth to spare on this device to be able to um, uh, utilize the bandwidth for a lot of different users at the same time. Um, so hopefully this is this is helpful to you to see the, the actual performance that you can get. You know, we're not trying to do any any trickery here. This is just a, a sort of standard test that anybody can run. Uh, this AJA system test light software is available um, in the Mac App Store. So anybody that wants to go off and test it can. Um, you know, you can. It's a really good way that once you've got your NAS set up before you seed any data to it. If you match these figures on the left hand side um, to the actual type of um, resolutions, codecs, file sizes that you're going to be using in your normal workflow, this is going to give you an immediate um, sort of instant satisfaction, if you like, that you set it up in the best way possible with the storage. Um, you know, sometimes people may want to do uh, the Q tiering option. We would generally advise against Q tiering for um, the creative professional um, because it's more of a scheduled performance boost, whereas you need the, the performance boost to be done in real time um, so that's where we would recommend either doing an ssd cache or like we've got here just create a volume straight on the ssds um, so you're not relying on say intelligence from within the nas to um, uh, allocate the performance in the correct place for you if you put the data on the ssd volume it's going to be fast there's, there's, there's an absolute assurance that it's just going to be a, a, an absolutely uh, mega connection speed so that you can do uh, video editing for really any any workflow type that you've got um, for multiple users so that's that's the key thing here that multiple users can do it um, um, all at the same time and if you ever wanted to share your finished workflow you can always go into um, say our file station here so if i was just to go down to file station so if you've got a file stored and you want to share it out so if i was to go into the, the public folder here so if I was wanted to share one of these files that I've got created here or this folder, so what I can do is I can right click on it and I can go down to one of the sharing options and I can create a share link. So if I wanted to pass this link out to somebody else, um, I could create external links here. So my external IP address, for example, um, I can create the link name and say, hi, yeah, um, this is um, for, for customer, let's say. So you can write for customer. Um, you can create it with SSL secure. You can choose whether or not you want to allow the person to be able to upload something back to this folder or not. And you can even have the link auto expire for you as well. Um, so if you wanted to um, 
have the link automatically um, stop working after a week, you can set that up. Um, if you wanted to manually end them, there is the share link management down here on the left as well. Um, so anything that you create, so if we was to set a password and just call it test, if we create this now, it gives you a nice little copy and paste that you can do. Um, but because I've now shared out that folder, if I go down to share link management, it will be there. And if for whatever reason you do want to end that share, you don't want it to expire in the week that I've set, um, you can go on here and you can just right click on this and you can actually stop sharing it immediately. Um, so it's going to delete that share link so that nobody has access to the data. The share link that's created has absolutely no reference to the files that you're sharing. So nobody's going to guess what it is. So although I was sharing a folder there called MacBook Air, at no point was MacBook Air in the link that was created. It, it's very easy to do. Um, so if anybody has any questions, we're going to keep the session open um, and we're going to go through um, and, and try to answer those in, in real time for anybody that does have any questions. Oh, let's see, one's just appeared uh, from Rutka. Um, how many NVMe SSDs can you fit in this NAS, the 872 XT? Um, so, complicated question. It depends how you want to set it up. Um, without removing any of the built-in hardware that we've got, such as the Thunderbolt 3 ports that also take up a PCI Express slot, the maximum you could fit in there is six with the NVMe's. That's using the two onboard M.2 slots, um, and that's using the, the maximum size of a PCIe card that we have, which is a four port. So that would add together to be six. Um, if for whatever reason you wanted to remove the Thunderbolt 3 um, card out of the device, you could technically put two of our um, QM2 cards in there. So that would give you a total of 10 NVMEs. Um, obviously you can put sort of SATA SSDs in the drive base, so you could have another eight SATA SSDs, but yeah, for NVMEs and the NVMe speed, um, the maximum without removing the Thunderbolt ports would be um, would be six. Um, I see there's a question here from Danny. Um, what performance can you expect on the pool uh, with Ironwolf Pro drives? Well, let's have a look here. I can actually do a test of that for you right now. Let's stop this test. Grab the software. <clears throat> Obviously, it's going to be much slower than the um, like the SSDs. But it shouldn't be too bad. So here, if I click to the data folder, which is the one on the Ironwolf Pro drives, and then I click start with the same settings. <clears throat> so still not too shabby, but um, yeah, it's it's you know it's colossally different performance on the specs. I think something like an Ironwolf Pro hard drive um, quotes something like 260 megabytes per second as the absolute maximum speed that you can get from an Ironwolf Pro drive. Um, so, you know, with the, the five drives working together here, I'm able to sort of achieve a much higher speed there on the read, um, but that's the uh, performance you're gonna get from hard drives only. Um, obviously you can nearly double or triple that number there um, if you wanted to, especially on the right speed, if you used an SSD cache. So if you wanted to boost the performance um, of the slower hard drive layer, um, you can have a relatively small investment on two SSDs, um, use them as a read and write cache, and it's going to massively improve the performance here. But yeah, this is the speed to the, uh, the hard drive layer. I got a question here from Derek. Um, on the Thunderbolt connection, can a data file have an alias name created, which is then dragged into the folder pane for logging into it? Not sure what I think you mean by that, Derek. Sorry, you got a bit more information on that one? Uh, question from Trevor. Uh, you said that the Thunderbolt speeds are faster than 10 gigabit ethernet, but if I've got it right, the speeds you showed from a single user Thunderbolt port did not seem faster. Can we get it faster than 10 gigabit ethernet? So one of the, the speeds that I was getting there was actually quite a bit faster. So I think Thunderbolt, uh, sorry, 10 gig ethernet would cap out at about 1200. Um, so if I was to connect in with, um, let's have a look here. Open it back up and connect to the, um, the SSD volume here. Run the start. And so 1200 megabytes per second would be about the absolute maximum that you would expect to get on a absolutely perfect 10 gig connection. So depending on what your codec type is, this number may change. So here, if I was to change it from say a 10, a 16 bit codec down to something a bit smaller, like 10 bit, um, we might get a different result here on the different options. So as you change the codec type, the actual performance will change. Um, I generally find that you're only gonna get 1200 megabytes per second on a 10 gig connection. Um, if you're using the absolute perfect data set, 
Um, these numbers, as I say, are just representative from a benchmark test. Your real world data types are going to be different. Um, but this is the uh, the maximum speed that we're able to achieve um, on this NAS. If you want something that's faster than this, as Tom mentioned in his um, slides, we do have the TVS-1282 T3. Um, so in the slides, this, this specific NAS, um, according to our website, says it can only do 1200 megabytes per second. Um, I have managed to, you know, change in some settings around. I have managed to see it up at 1400, um, but with the 1282 T3, you can actually get 1600 megabytes a second out of it. Um, and the driver for Windows actually performs better on Thunderbolt networking. So if you do have Windows um, editing with Thunderbolt 3, um, you are able to get something closer to around 1800 megabytes a second. Uh, so I see there's a another question from Trevor saying, um, all the IP settings seem complex. How can we find out how to configure all of the Thunderbolt ports and 10 gig ports? It's certainly not in the manual. Will you be covering it today? Um, so I've actually done no configuration in this setup um, of the Thunderbolt ports. All I did was simply connect and it automatically assigns. Um, so if I was to show you here, this, this might be getting a bit complex, but hopefully I can explain it in a way that makes sense. Um, so if you ever connect a, a network device to something else, so if you happen to have uh, two laptops or, or, or two PCs or even a, even a Mac and a PC separately, um, any device that works on the network, if there's nothing there to give you an IP address, um, it will automatically default to what we call a class B IP range, which is a 169.254 at the start. So the NAS does that, your clients will do that, everything happens automatically. And especially on a Mac, the Apple Bonjour system will take over. So effectively the QNAP is shouting out with the Apple Bonjour protocol, hi, I'm here, hi, I'm here, this is the services I offer. Um, it's a bit like um, plug and play, but on a Mac. Um, so it's shouting itself out. So I've done absolutely nothing with the IP addresses. I literally just connected my connection to it um, and it's it's all happening completely automatically. I've not had to do anything um, uh, to get this connection up and working. Um, I'm not accessing the NAS over an IP address myself. I mean, obviously that's happening in the background, but when you open up Finder here and you scroll down, it just comes up as a nice, easy to know name. So whatever you name the NAS, um, I'm generally naming my NAS the model number of the NAS because I have quite a few of them. Um, but in, in your organization, you would probably call it storage or, or, or file server or something different. But what I'm seeing here is the connections. I'm not looking at all the complex IP addresses, the 169.254s that appear in the background. Um, so you can ignore all of that. As a, as a normal setup, you don't have to do any of that work. And when you connect the QNAP's network ports, to your normal network where your internet router is, things like that. There's a there's a piece of um, uh, server software usually running inside the router called a DHCP server. So whenever your phones, your laptops, or your NAS connects to that network where the DHCP server is, it automatically gives an IP address out to the QNAP. The QNAP's default settings is to get an IP address from something on the network that's giving them out. Um, so although it does seem maybe a little bit complex with all the different numbers that you can set, you don't actually have to set anything on the NAS if you don't want to. The automatic IP address on the network ports will happen automatically from your router and the uh, the, the connection between the Thunderbolt interfaces, all of this happens automatically. Um, my OCD nature would not let me set a number like 169.254.8.24 in, that's a bit, that's not round enough. Um, but you know, if I was to set it manually, I would pick something very different from that i would i would configure it specifically but i'm just trying to illustrate here that you just have to set it um to something at the start with a 169.254 but your mac your pcs your devices all do that automatically when there's nothing giving out ip addresses automatically and between the qnap and your laptops that you connect directly with thunderbolt there is no extra network connection there. It's a direct connect between the two so that you're not actually in the network there with your router on that connection. It's a private connection between uh, you and the NAS. Um, so that's why it comes up as just a standard IP. But as I said, at no point during any of the connections that I've done, have I had to use the IP address. You simply come down, you pick the name from your favorite locations or you go into network and pick a different one and then you just connect to it. Um, there's absolutely nothing to do with these numbers. It's just done by nice friendly naming conventions. It all set up happens completely in the background automatically. Um, hopefully that, that helps you there, Trevor. Okay, well, if, if that's all the questions, um, thanks very much for, for joining. Um, we do have a, another session on the, uh, the 10th of September. 
Um, this is about our new QUTS um, cloud operating system that you, you can deploy in, in services like AWS. Um, so if you are interested in that, we will be doing a, another webinar there on the um, on the 10th of September. So anybody interested, um, I'll see you there at that one. Um, if I did miss any questions, um, I will come back to you um, right after the session um, um, on email to see if uh, I can get to those. But, um, oh, sorry, there's one final question just popped up. Um, I actually have a 672 recent acquisition. Uh, can I connect the NAS uh, through Cloud Digit Thunderbolt for pass through without consequence? So you can connect the Thunderbolt device. It doesn't have to be necessarily directly connected to the computer itself. It can go through um, like a dock or something else that's separate. So long as it truly is Thunderbolt, um, you know, a lot of the docks out there are actually USB type C. Um, but yes, if you've got an external dock, external device, um, the only thing we can't do is you can't pass through the QNAP. So you, you once you've got the QNAP connected to your Mac, the extra Thunderbolt port on the back of the QNAP cannot do pass through for other Thunderbolt devices because we turn um, that Thunderbolt connection into a network port. Um, but let's say you had a, a nice Thunderbolt display connected to your Mac. Um, yes, you can connect that to your Mac and you can then connect the QNAP to the Thunderbolt display. So you can still do um, uh, sort of daisy chaining in that respect. So, so long as the QNAP is at the end of the chain, it will work just fine. Um, you just can't daisy chain after the QNAP in, in that series of runs. Um, okay. So if that was the, the last question. Um, so anything I did miss, I will I will come back after the session. I'll go, um, I'll export the questions just so that I can see I haven't missed anything. Um, but yeah, so see you again on the uh, the 10th of September if you're interested in QUTS Cloud. Uh, thanks a lot for coming to this one. Um, hopefully we, uh, we were able to, to show you something different. Okay, thanks a lot.